it's time for the content. So I will invite our first keynote speaker, uh, Alisa Knight, uh, who will talk about like playing with fire, but not the element, the regulation. Right? <laughs> Hey, Mehdi, it's always a pleasure to have you introduce me. Thank you very much. You know, I guess this is our inaugural event where we can announce uh, me now taking over the security track as the new program chair. So I'm excited about that and I'm honored. I'm You guys are uh, an amazing brand and platform and APIs and um, I'm glad to be a part of it. So I, I want to give you my appreciation for that. Yeah, and it's a great announcement that uh, you know the API security is is becoming uh, is really booming. Is uh, is um, the the market is booming? A lot of tools, everything, and so we could have we couldn't have someone better than you to monitor Aww. and to track and to uh, MC and and program chair the API security. So we're really glad to have you for that. And this is why we 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 invited you again to present all the work you're doing on the security of APIs. You used to do it in banking with an amazing talk about hacks you found in banking apps <laughs> and banking APIs. Uh, really long for a while, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and now it seems you, you, uh, you're, you focus on healthcare uh, at some yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, it's it's healthcare today. Who knows what it'll be tomorrow? <laughs> I'm always hacking something through APIs, but um, yeah, it's it's I I definitely like to keep everybody on their toes. That's for sure. Yeah. So um, um, yeah, a lot of people are in, um, involved and are promoting you know some new APIs, but yeah, they have to do it the right way and being yeah. sure that you know. Uh, it's not a single point of failure <laughs> or an entry <laughs> door for malicious uh, people. So yeah, your work is really to warn companies and warn industries about what's happening. And so it seems you have prepared something for us for healthcare APIs, right? Yeah. So um, as Mehdi mentioned, um, this is uh, titled Playing with Fire. So this is actually phase two of my of my research into hacking healthcare APIs. So I'm really excited to be uh, uh, unveiling a lot of that today. I've got some new screenshots from my hacking research where I access tens of thousands of, of patient records through these uh, unsecure APIs. So we'll definitely be keeping uh, the audience excited. So I appreciate all of you for joining. So with that, Mehdi, I'll go ahead and uh, take the stage. Yeah, take the stage. Uh -huh. See you in 30 minutes, bye. Awesome, thank you, Mehdi. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I know it's probably very early for some of you. <laughs> it is for me, so uh, I'm probably not going to be as charismatic as I usually am. Um, I'm only on my first cup of coffee, so I apologize. Um, so yes, uh, playing with fire. The puns are limitless um, <laughs> with fire, but uh, I'm going to quickly just talk about myself. For those of you who don't know me, um, I kind of am wondering when I'm going to get to that point where I just don't have to cover myself anymore because everyone knows who I am. Uh, maybe I'm already there. I don't know. Um, but uh, this is how you can reach me. You can reach me. There's my email address. Uh, you can also follow me on social media and subscribe to my YouTube. The, a lot of people ask, hey, Alyssa, what's the best way we can support you? The best way is to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hit that those like buttons. Hit that, uh, that bell icon. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Connect with me on LinkedIn. And just reshare my content. You know, tell your friends about it. Um, uh, I'm always uh, keeping it exciting, as many mentioned. Uh, so I, I am a recovering hacker of over two decades. I, I've been doing this for a while. I lived in uh, Stuttgart, Germany for a while, hacking at connected cars. I published the first book on hacking connected cars. Um, I was actually looking for the book. Um, I think it's downstairs. Um, but yeah, if you, if you don't have your copy, pick up your copy today. I, I walk you through step by step how you can actually hack connected cars. I'm in the process of writing a new book that will be published by Wiley next year. Um, and that's on hacking APIs. I started and sold two previous cybersecurity startups as a serial entrepreneur. Um, so I'm actually in the process of exiting on my third. I've started a venture capital fund. Uh, so I've kind of been all over the place. Um, my wife and I actually own a family of companies, M&A Night Capital, M&A Night Entertainment, um, and Night Inc. And I'm actually a filmmaker. So uh, I'm also doing screenwriting. I'm working on a new screenplay right now uh, for a new TV series. Uh, and um, I've hacked a lot of APIs. Uh, so in 2019, as Mehdi mentioned, I hacked 30 financial services and fintech mobile apps and spoke about it in different countries. 2020 was um, M Health apps, uh, federal and state law enforcement vehicles through APIs. There's a great video of that on my YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it yet, I urge you to see it. Um, there's actually two videos up there. 
Um, so really exciting things to come. Uh, and I'm also hacking connected trains. So uh, definitely interesting. So uh, really quickly, how this came to be uh, approved. So I'm a content creator. So I work with cybersecurity vendors to create really cinematic videos, write white papers for them, but through the lens of an adversary, through the lens of a hacker. So there's a lot of content out there, blogs and papers on, you know, through the lens of the blue team or the defender or the developer. But what about the lens of the adversary? So that's what I've created at Night Inc., which I call adversarial content. And so uh, Approve approached us and said, hey, look, you know, we're an API security vendor. We want you to create some content for us. And I said, okay, well, what if we were to hack stuff and show how your product would have prevented it? And so that's exactly what I've been doing for Approve. And so they sponsored this research. Phase one was hacking mHealth APIs. Phase two is hacking Fire APIs. I'm going to go into a little of the background on Fire. I won't go into too much detail, but I think I want to include because it's interesting. And a lot of people think that as hackers, we just kind of come out of the womb knowing how to do this stuff. I actually have to research it. When I walked into this, I had no idea how to even spell Fire. I had no idea how to spell API. Um, but you know that to me, a hacker is just learning something just as just as good as the person who wrote it, and and throwing stimulus at it that the developer didn't expect to receive. That to me is hacking, right? So you can download this research data and the rest of the research uh, from Approve.io. Um, as well as the phase one report. And phase two is actually going to be uh, unveiled here soon. Um, a lot of you uh, may be familiar with the HIMSS conference. It's the world's largest healthcare conference. We're going to be unveiling the research at that conference as well as more screenshots and more data. So I want to quickly explain the timeline here. Um, again, because I'm a nerd and this is really interesting to me. Um, I know you're here for the hacking stuff, but I swear, I promise we'll get to that. Um, it was really interesting in my research to find out that the first healthcare IT system actually was deployed in the 1960s. It's a long time ago, right? And, you know, if you look at the timeline here, um, it's it's really interesting because healthcare hasn't really come that far since then. Um, a lot of the systems before fire... Uh, and before a lot of this, like the information blocking rule, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, basically the systems are disparate and can't talk to each other. So you have these EHR systems or electronic healthcare record systems that basically were their own islands and they couldn't talk. Um, HL7 arrived in 1987 and Health Health Level 7 International or HL7 is also the name of the standard. So it's the name of the organization, HL7 International, but the standard is HL7. Um, so before FIRE, there was version 2, version 3. And then came along, you know, this clinical document architecture, which actually is a part of HL7 v3, I found out, uh, which was interesting. But these are just like the 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 different iterations or releases of this uh, the standard uh, for these EHR systems or EMR, or, you know, different uh, different um, acronyms. And in 2014, HL7 Fire launched. Um, they're using web interface. Apple was involved in this. Um, there's something I'm going to talk to you guys about, guys and girls about, called Smart or Smart on Fire. And um, that actually originated out of Boston Children's Hospital. And so uh, in 2016, this is where it started to get interesting. The 21st Century Cures Act made APIs a requirement for certified health IT. And so this really changed things, right? So basically the government got involved and said, yeah, things are a mess. We had this JSON task force, um, JSON task force that came and said, look, you know, this is a real mess. This is a real crap show. Um, we need to fix this. Uh, and uh, an API approach was what was selected. So that was when we saw the release of Smart on Fire specification and JSON, uh, the JSON task force came along and recommended a public API for healthcare. Uh, then in 20, again, uh, that uh, a little bit shortly after the Argonaut project launched and Plant Smart and EHRs, um, the 21st Century Cures Act made APIs a requirement for certified health IT in 2016. Cerner launched Smart on Fire Developer Sandbox. Um, all scripts in Epic launched Smart on Fire Developer Sandboxes. Now, you're probably wondering, Alyssa, what the heck is the difference between Smart and Smart on Fire and Fire and Smart on Fire? Um, 
uh, I'll ex I've got a slide that explains that, but what you, all of you need to understand is it basically adds um, really security, if you will, to fire. And it also makes it an, uh, makes healthcare an app-based economy. And I'll again, talk to you about that in a moment, but um, <clears throat> Microsoft gets involved around 20, a little after in 2019, uh, launching smart on fire APIs in the Azure product. So you can go into Azure, you can go into AWS and launch, launch a, a fire server. It's really interesting. Uh, even Google cloud has one, um, so you, it's really easy to go into these cloud service providers and quickly launch something like this. And then in 2020, the file, final rule on ONC specified smart is a universal apps API to implement 21st century Cures Act. The um, office for the national coordinator came in, basically government um, and uh, CMS uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services came in and said, hey, look, uh, this is going to be a requirement. If if you're an, a, an a healthcare payer, if you're a healthcare provider, yeah, you guys need to do this. Um, it's it, we're going to make it mandatory, and then we're going to create this information blocking rule that states that if you violate this and you and you don't allow patients and any third party to be able to access these patient records, uh, you're going to be in violation of this information blocking rule, and it, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Stiff penalties, fines, all that fun stuff. Okay, so. Fire version 4.01, I believe, is the current version. Um, and this is actually a list of all of the resources that are available. And, and the, again, this is a RESTful API um, for you developers in the audience. Um, and so a lot of these over here on the right-hand side are all of the current version 4.01 resources for Fire, uh, implementing things, like I said, for the you know billing, payments. Um, you've got things in here for medications and just... Um, a lot of stuff that's that's needed for this information sharing. And I couldn't include all of the things here in the screen chat because it was so big. Um, but just understand that it, it just basically codifies and and creates these resources for every single thing you'd possibly need from, you know, for out of the EMR. In summary, what Fire does is it allows these different EHR systems to talk. It basically is like this Rosetta Stone. It it it's a translator. It it's it specifies how the data should be structured. So um, you know this 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 you know smart can we you can build apps for it and 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 build third party applications. So if a hospital wants to use a third party application or an app that can feed into their EHR system, they don't have to jump through all these hoops and it's not this huge circus. Uh, they're using Fire. It's standard, and every, these specific apps support Fire, right? So it basically allows these systems to finally talk. And let's talk about Fire versus Smart on Fire because you're going to see references to Smart and the different apps that have been testing and APIs have been testing. Fire basically defines the structure and look of the data in the system. It's it's basically the bones. It's the skeleton. EHRs fill that system with patient records. Okay, so when I hack an API. A Fire API or M Health API, there's I'm I'm getting access to the patient records, the EHR, the electronic health records, uh, PHI, protected healthcare information, whatever you want to call it. So many acronyms for it. Um, smart instruments that system with an ecosystem apps that can be run on top of it. So it's basically um, Smart came in and said, "Hey, look, you know, um, we're not going to compete against you. What you guys are doing with Fire, we're just we're going to stop trying to compete against you and not try and be this alternative. You win." Um, we're basically going to make it possible for people to develop apps for it and these third parties and be able to actually turn our healthcare system globally, not in the United States alone, but globally, everyone, um, <clears throat> this standard is being adopted. And Smart came along and said, you know, we're going to be able to give you, we're going to turn this into an app-based economy. Uh, Fire provides an API and a set of data models for structuring and accessing medical data. Uh, and again, it's a it's a RESTful API. Smart provides a standard for how EHR systems and their applications authenticate and integrate using OAuth and OpenID Connect. And we'll talk about that too. So Smart Compliant EHR system on top of a Fire server is basically the best way to say it. All right. So why Smart? Um, an app developer can write an app once and expect that it will run anywhere in the healthcare system, including outside the United States. So if you want to write, write you know, you're, you're feeling um, uh, saucy and you want to create an app, uh, a healthcare app, you can write one. And as long as you support that fire standard, um, it can be run anywhere. 
at any hospital, at any provider. It basically creates an app store for health, the health ecosystem. And then um, Smart on Fire provides a health app interface based on open standards, including HL7's Fire, all through an open ID connect. I'm really bad at running over on my time, so I'll try and hurry up. Uh, this is the Firestarter app uh, we called Firestarter that um, uh, my good friend and uh, colleague over at um, Approve, uh, Skip Huffsmith, created. Uh, this is just a screenshot of that app um, that uh, he created for my research for me to use. These are the testing phases. Phase one, again, was mHealth. Um, then doing traffic analysis of the API between the health app and the backend API. Um, then fuzzing. Phase two is fire, which we're talking uh, more about today. A testing of the fire APIs against major Asia's. Obviously, I'm not going to name drop them um, and, and tell you exactly what vulnerabilities were found with which system, but just know that we tested the major EHR systems and there's only a few. So if you're familiar with the healthcare industry, you probably know who, who, who those companies are. Uh, then I did traffic analysis and then um, fuzzing. And I, I do want to talk today a little bit about fuzzing and the importance of it. Um, but this was phase one. So let's get into the findings, which is a lot of what you guys are, guys and girls are here for today. Um, the uh, There were four major vulnerabilities that I found in my testing. And number one was broken object level authorization or bowl of vulnerabilities. And um, I'll quickly explain what a bowl of vulnerability is. It basically is you're authenticated, you're allowed to talk to the API, but you're not authorized to request the data that you're requesting. So in this particular case, I went after this and again, um, yes, these are company names, but I'm not attributing any specific vulnerabilities to them. I'm just giving you them as an example. So this hospital may be running Cerner. This hospital may be running Epic, running their own individual APIs. The systems cannot talk to each other. Um, uh, what happens if a patient goes to this hospital? Hospital finds out they're allergic to um, uh, to penicillin, and then they go to this hospital, which is running Epic, a completely different system. It can't talk to this hospital, so there's no data on that patient. Um, and in this exercise, um, identifying broken user authentication vulnerabilities, excessive data exposure, and mass assignment. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with it, the OWASP API Security Top 10 is a new list that was published in 2019, listing all of these top 10 vulnerabilities and APIs. Uh, so this was a lot of, these are screenshots of the actual findings. A lot of these are redacted um, for obvious reasons, but uh, here's the architecture. Basically, I downloaded the, um, the app onto my phone, uh, and obviously there are Fire mobile apps uh, for iOS and Android. Downloaded the apps, uh, basically interdicted the traffic, sat in the middle of it, uh, using an SSL decryptor tool, or what, what I like to call woman in the middle attack tool. And then pass it into um, Postman. If Postman, if you're in the audience, I absolutely adore and love you guys um, and girls and uh, appreciate what you guys have done. You guys have created an awesome API client. Um, so here as Dr. Hacker, I'm basically intercepting this traffic, figuring out what the backend API endpoint is expecting from the client, and then just replicating that API request in Postman and then requesting the same stuff and I don't have to take, extract that app off my phone. I don't have to try and run it in a Joe rooted or, or Joe broken um, environment. It's it's just looking at the traffic and figuring out how the API works that way. So again, hacking is just learning how something works and then throwing stimulus at it that the API didn't expect. Now, in this particular case, I'm requesting patients slash 1001 is the object. And um, I found with Bola vulnerability, I was able to change that to 1002 and cycle through them and pull thousands of patient records. Here on the right-hand side, all of you can see this. Uh, these are screenshots of the some of my findings. Um, here in Postman, of course, uh, you can see my API requests. Uh, within Postman, there's actually this really cool capability to export what you get back as a file. So this is an actual screenshot of a medical record, pathology reports, and x-rays. Um, I was able to access everything, radiology reports um, for these patients and download them and, and actually export them as PDF files, which was really neat. I didn't know Postman could do that. 
Uh, again, here's a screenshot of the pathology report that I still, um, these are all sanctioned pen tests, of course. I, I'm not saying that I did anything illegal or, or that this was not sanctioned. Um, here's the actual API endpoint. And you can see the PDF file here. The interesting thing here is I found out because of a bowl of vulnerability, I was able to generate or, or request any PDF I wanted by just simply changing those numbers. For the developers in the audience, don't do that. Do not randomly generate numbered uh, file names, especially incrementing them by uh, as a number that I can guess. In this particular case, they just incremented the file name by one. So the, in this case, there was 842,000 documents in that in that um, API uh, endpoint, and I just cycled through those numbers and was able to pull report after report after report. Um, developers, do not do that. That's a bad idea. Um, okay, so hard-coded API keys and tokens. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. I used to really be big on, you know, oh, use a code obfuscate or obfuscate the code if you're going to store the stuff in your app. You know, I get that you have to store it in there, but I actually uh, have changed my position on that. You know, at the end of the day, it, it, I, I don't even really use the keys and tokens anyway that I find hard coded in there. I'm doing network analysis. I mean, even if you did obfuscate the code, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, as a hacker, I'm still finding a way around it. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. But I, my recommendation is if you're going to do it, just use it. Um, you know, use those keys and tokens as an app identifier. Um, instead of using it as a single form of authentication uh, and authenticate the app. And I'll talk to, you, talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, and there's some great solutions like Approve where you can compile their SDK with your mobile app. Uh, this is me stealing hospital admission records. So in this particular case with this API, um, I'm getting the results back for all of these individual patients that were administered and, and, and led into the hospital. Um, the interesting thing here that a lot of you may not know is that um, EHR or e, um, PHI records are worth a thousand times more on the dark web than a regular credit card number. So they're worth a lot of money on the dark web to be monetized. I think it's because of the data amount of data. I'm going to pick on um, uh, Medi for a minute, but like if I want to kill Medi, for example, um, and I wanted to make it look like um, you know a, an act of God. Uh, I would hack a, a hospital and find what Medi is allergic to. Let's say he's allergic to bee stings, um, and pull and hacking that API, finding that out, and then just you know unleashing a bunch of bees on poor Medi. Um, so that's a great example. This is, this is very sensitive, very dangerous information in the wrong hands. Um, you know, my, my recommendation of course is, um, you know, and, and let me make this point also, it wasn't just the patient's records. I found when you're talking about hospital records, they also asked for next of kin information, family information. So there were, there were family member members data in here as well, not just the patient. Um, this was a very interesting vulnerability, uh, for you developers be really careful not to hard code things like secrets and reuse them. So what, what happened here on the left-hand side, if you can see this, you can see that little um, field there in the payload called secret and then a string of letters and numbers. Well, what that was, was I found out, I saw that packet appear when I unlocked my iPhone with Face ID. And so <clears throat> what happened was it resumed the session once I unlocked it and the app sent the secret to the API. Well, I found out that it, with this particular vendor, they actually hard-coded that secret and it was the same every time. <laughs> Shame on you, developers. If, if you're doing something bad or lazy, or if you, if you just don't know what you're doing, hackers will find it. So don't be lazy. Um, you know, it, the, those are definitely um, shame on you kind of stuff. Just don't do stuff like that. We'll find it as hackers if it's there. Um, and here on the right-hand side, you can see that the um, results were returned back to me for the patient records I was requesting, which ended up being a bowl of vulnerability. Um, the other thing was there was no time limit, right? There, like, I, like weeks later, could come in and, and just re using Burp Suite, uh, replay the same secret and get that information back. All right, so let's talk about playing with fire. So I want to explain that there's both certified and non-certified fire APIs. I want to preface, I want to make this abundantly clear to all of you. I'm not saying that just because the EHR 
certified the API that it's more secure. It just means that the um, uh, the the organization came in that certified it and said, "Hey, look, I'm trying to remember who certifies. Is it the? I think it's the ONC. I think is the ONC or CMS. I think it's the ONC. Um, will come in even if they certify. It doesn't mean that it's say it's secure, right? Because nothing is purely secure. Nothing is 100% secure." But they came. They come in and make sure that it was implemented according to the standard properly. Um, so what Fire does is again, it allows if a patient goes to this hospital and then this hospital, um, it basically allows these systems to communicate and talk. Finally, it's that Rosetta Stone that allows these things to talk. Um, there's non-certified A Fire APIs as well. So there's certified, non-certified. And one of the vendors that I spoke to will um, be certified by the end of the year. And they claim that they will be the first company to cert be certified. So it's it's not like a thing yet. It's, it's something that the companies are actively working on. Because um, remember, a lot of these, the deadlines are, are coming up here shortly. Um, this is all new stuff. Uh, and then this is a provider that that just is not on fire. So there's certified fire, non-certified fire, and then just a, a healthcare provider that's not using fire APIs at all. And it's just a regular mHealth API. All right, this is my tech lab set, setup. So for those of you who are interested in how what tools did I use, how did I get that stuff, um, these are some great tools that you can go download today for hacking if you want to get into hacking APIs. For you developers who want to learn how to do this, um, if there's any pen testers or red teamers in the audience who want to get into APIs, uh, this is a great list. Um, Burp Suite, uh, of course, Community Edition is free. I use the paid version, not much of a difference there. Mobile APIs, uh, when you're testing those, you can use mo Mobile Security Framework, which does both SAST and DAST, or Static Code Analysis, Dynamic Code Analysis. Midim Proxy, which is that woman in the middle attack tool that I told you about, plus Postman. What that does is, because a lot of these apps, uh, shame on you, developers again, um, Boy, all the developers in the audience are going to hate me by the end of this presentation. But um, uh, but a lot of the developers weren't implementing certificate pinning in their apps, uh, which is a big no-no. Um, definitely do it. I understand you're scared of breaking the app if, if something goes wrong, but there there's ways like, for example, Approve will, will help you in making sure that the certificates are... Um, uh, are the pinning is easily managed. So it's actually um, easily to implement. Easier to implement. Burp Suite Proxy and Repeater APK Extractor, which um, ironically enough was in the Google Play Store. APK Extractor allowed me to actually extract the mobile apps off of the mobile device, load it into MobSF, and basically search for those hard-coded API keys and tokens. Um, just in general, fuzzers. Uh, I'm, this is really important for all of you. I'm really big into fuzzing. It helps you identify vulnerabilities in the API that a typical like vulnerability scanner can't find. Content discovery tools like Kite Runner, um, and and then my OS of choice is, is Mac OS. Uh, David Sopas has done some amazing work in this area. For those of you who have not seen it, he created an amazing mind map of all these different tools for hacking and instrumenting API attacks. Uh, these are some of the tools that I use. Um, again, for traffic analysis, Burp Suite OWASP Zap is a great traffic analysis tool. And Midim Proxy, um, APK Leaks for Android, uh, for enumeration, FFUF like Fuzzers, Kite Runner, Arjun, um, authorization tools, Astra, Appador, Susanu, Jot Tool, Jot Cracker, API Check, API Fuzzer uh, for injection, um, Wrestler. For those of you who are quickly joining, just take a screenshot of this slide. These are these are probably I think the best tools out of all of them. Um, so write these down, go grab them, and play with them there. They're great tools. Uh, the interesting thing about Rustler is it was actually developed over at Microsoft, and it's actually the first stateful, um, the first stateful fuzzer. And the interesting thing about Rustler is um, so you can import in the Swagger file or Open API file; it'll test it. And actually, Kite Runner. The interesting thing about Kite Runner is it actually pulls all of these Swagger files uh, off the internet and actually uses them for content discovery. It's really cool. It's really powerful. Uh, here's some screenshots of those fuzzing at um, attacks against the um, Fire APIs. So this is me running Kite Runner. 
this is the output. Uh, I would urge all of you again. I I I would dare to say that you're not going to find all the vulnerabilities that you can find if you're not fuzzing. It is so important to fuzz. Um, Wrestler again developed at Microsoft. It's the first stateful REST API fuzzing tool for automatically testing cloud services through the REST APIs and finding security and reliability bugs in these services. Um, when Microsoft does develop tools, uh, I, I'm really happy with them, right? Uh, Rustler's a great tool. You have to definitely check it out. Again, for giving cloud service with an open API Swagger specification, Rustler analyzes its entire specification and then generates and executes tests that exercise the service through its REST API. So basically, that's a lot of fancy speak for the fact that it's a REST API fuzzer. And um, the interesting thing about Rustler is I believe it actually even comes with like a test API you can, uh, REST API you can actually test against um, there's a GitHub project for go, go check it out. Um, hacking with Burp Suite. Uh, this is me targeting the Fire APIs with Burp Suite. Basically, um, okay, so this is actually really neat. I love this about Burp Suite. There's a button within Burp Suite that you can click and it actually loads up Chromium and it automatically, automagically, um, forwards all of the packets in through Burp Suite's proxy for you to analyze. And that's what you see here as a screenshot. Um, and then I'm just taking those uh, those packets, and then once they're captured by the proxy, I'm just forwarding them on uh, to the endpoint, right? So the best practices in securing APIs. So we we went through um, my hacking of M Health APIs, hacking of Fire APIs, some of the screenshots of the results, and and the tools that I use to do it. I think a lot of you, the most common thing is Alyssa. You focus on hacking and breaking things and blowing, <laughs> um, blowing stuff up. Sorry, I don't know if I can use four letter words here. Um, sorry, Maddie. Um, but um, you yeah, know, just blowing stuff up and. Uh, uh, I, I, I get yelled at for not focusing enough on how to fix the problem. So I'm going to help a lot of you developers out there with this. Um, in my testing, the only API I wasn't able to breach was actually protected by Approve. Um, so we had the, the APIs that were sort of like naked. Um, I do want to say this because I've said it a lot and I want to emphasize it here. Stop trying to secure your APIs with WAFs. Stop doing it. WAFs are not going to protect you against things like BOLA vulnerabilities, um, authorization, logic-based issues. Um, they're just not going to do it. Um, they're, they're designed for identifying different indicators of compromise like SQL injection, rules-based stuff. Um, the, the APIs that I was able to successfully hack were secured by, by WAFs. The API that uh, I wasn't able to actually hack was secured by approved. So I think that says a lot, right? Uh, authorization vulnerabilities are everywhere. And so, oh, one thing I do want to make sure I, I point out uh, and emphasize is you actually just simply, they, they, they really reduce the friction on developers. They allow the developer to compile uh, their app with their SDK. And so what happens is that it works like a proxy system where um, the API will not talk to you. Like I can't throw my hacker tools at it because approves uh, uh, security solutions saying, oh, sorry, these packets were not generated by the legitimate app that was compiled with our SDK, so I'm not going to talk to you. It's actually super sexy. It's really cool. Uh, authorization vulnerabilities are everywhere. Authenticate, but also authorize. Ensure that scopes are being used with tokens. Developers, if you're going to use tokens, use scopes. Don't implement tokens and not scopes. It doesn't make sense. Um, a lot of the APIs that I've looked at implement you know, tokens, but there's there's no scope supplied. Um, shame on you. Don't do that. Jot tokens should have really short time to lives. Um, I ran into some Jot tokens that were just too long, like days. Um, there was one API I came back, um, and I think you may have seen in one of the screenshots where you could see that it was like actually months later, like around December, Christmas time, where it came back and 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 the token was still valid. Um, stop doing that. Make them like five to ten minutes long. Um, use refresh tokens. They can be revoked. Access tokens can't. You can't revoke an access token. Um, refresh tokens are are really flexible in that way that if it's compromised. Um, let's say, for example, I post it online and paste bin or something, and I paste bin you, uh, you can easily revoke a refresh token. 
Approve uh, really our specialists in protecting APIs consumed by mobile apps. So you have you have mobile APIs, web APIs, right? So because it's it's really challenging to secure them, your your attacker can go into the app store and download your mobile app, right? So for these Fire APIs, I went out there, I downloaded the iOS and Android mobile apps. Uh, you're 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 giving your code, you're giving your app to the hacker, um, and you don't even know that they've downloaded it. Um, and, and they're saying they're playing with it, trying to figure out how to hack your API with it. Um, it's a really tough attack surface to, to try and secure. Um, so the, this approach of the, the way Approve is doing it is really, uh, really cool. Um, use hard-coded API keys and tokens uh, as app identifiers and not app secrets. I'm going to say that again. Use them as app identifiers, not app secrets. Get away from this idea, developers, of single-factor authentication. Um, if you're going to use them, use it as a form of multi-factor authentication and ensure that you actually authenticate the mobile app itself. Meaning that is the app talking to my API, the authorized app I should be talking to? Or is it Alyssa playing in Postman? Um, those are all, or Burp Suite, those are all things you need to think about. Uh, remember that Fire is a specification and doesn't mandate how it's secured. Vulnerabilities are per implementation. I want to make this abundantly clear. If Mehdi and I build a Fire API and we both, you know, we're basically following a, this blueprint, we're following the standard, right? It's not like we're buying a shrink-wrapped Fire API off of the shelves at Best Buy. Medi may implement it without security, and I may implement it with security. I, I, uh, you know, Medi may implement it with security. I may just completely bork and break security, um, and and I've messed it all up. But it's still Fire, right? It's still Fire. It's just Medi implemented security, and I didn't. So with that. Um, I want to thank all of you for sitting through this. Um, and I, I appreciate you. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Uh, we as content creators, as influencers, uh, we rely on support from our fans, from our followers. And, and I want to thank you for, for attending AP Days New York. And I have a great time, like have an amazing time. There's some amazing speakers here. I emceed the security track yesterday. Um, there's a great lineup of content at API Days, which is why I, I'm really excited to be part of uh, the organization and the brand now and and being the new um, committee chair for the uh, program chair for the security track. So um, have fun the rest of the day. And I believe we do have some time for questions uh, if any questions are in. Um, so yeah, Mehdi, you've got the microphone. Yes, thank you very much, Alisa. So we have a few questions. The, the banking industry had Fido Alliance setting kind of security authorization standard, authentication authorization standards. Does we need the same for healthcare? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, so F, uh, so Fido Alliance, uh, it's it's amazing. I'm I'm very familiar with it. Actually, very got very involved with it um, when I was an analyst. For those of you who follow me, know that I used to be an analyst. And um, uh, did a lot of content around Fido. Um, you know, uh, I am worried because number one, what are what are we as humans notorious for doing? Everybody, what are we notorious for doing? We're notorious for innovating first and securing second, right? We we need to get into this, and I love this new term, shift everywhere, not just shift left and shift right, but shift everywhere, and. Um, uh, I th I'm I'm worried. I am genuinely worried. Uh, you know, ONCs come in and they set these deadlines for healthcare payers and healthcare providers to um, implement this by this deadline. And I think I I forgot the deadlines. I well, I know one one of the deadlines has passed already, and there's another one coming up in several weeks away or something. It's 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 coming. And and you know, from what I'm seeing. It, it scares me. It scares the hell out of me. If if Medi, if I if I hack your your medical data, right? It's way different than me hacking your Bank of America credit card or debit card. Bank of America will just send you a brand new card in the mail, and and issue you a new account. If I hack your medical history, uh, who sends you new medical history? 
There, there's no, <laughs> there's no way to do that. So, you know, great question. Yes, I do think so. Um, I don't know what that looks like. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm worried. And here's the other thing I, I, I've been, I, you know, I've been getting some amazing support, um, from some of these EHR companies and, um, they've been amazing. They've been very supportive of my research, believe it or not. It's not been adversarial at all. And they did come to me and say, Hey, Alyssa, um, what keeps us up at night is that what if our APIs are secure, secure, um, but let's say, for example, Maddie and Alyssa start a startup company and we are this API technology company and we, they, by law, they're required to allow us to pull this medical data and our API is less secure than theirs. You know, that's what keeps them up at night. And, you know, it's, it's good EHR data, PHI traveling from a, from a more secure enclave and a, in a, in a secure fire API. And then by law, them having to make that data available because the information blocking rule, and then, um, you know, it traveling to a less secure API that that's what keeps them up at night. And, you know, so like as a hacker, I'm going to try and hack Medi's API. I'm not going to try and go after this big 10 billion pound gorilla and steal the PHI from them. I'm going to go after the less secure API from, you know, Medi's startup. Yeah, we, we have uh, uh, two more minutes for a last question. So okay. n no trade-off with security, but how do you manage uh, the user experience and the developer experience as a platform still keeping security at the maximum level? I think, you know, for me, it's really important, and I'm trying to do hashtag more, please, um, for this, is that sending developers to secure code training. And, you know, if, if you're a developer... Um, you know, it's really important to continuously build your capacity and, and become better. And, you know, as developers, you know, don't rely on your, your employer to send you to secure code training, send yourself, right? You want to be the best developer you can be. You want to write the most secure code. You don't want to be that person that has bowl of vulnerabilities all over their API. Um, send yourself. And, and, and learn how to write more secure code. Um, I think that's my best recommendation is learn best practice or practices around writing more secure code. Shift left security and shield right. So, you know, implement security while the code is being written. And then shield right once it's in production and she'll, you know, and, and shift everywhere, you know, and, and just make sure that there's security at all stages of that software development lifecycle. Yeah, thank you for this great, great advice, Alisa. And we look forward to having great API security tracks uh, together with you at the new MC and the pro. Program chair, thank you for opening the day uh, uh, today. And now we will have a, a